like to welcome you. On behalf of Palisades Village, I'm Erica Blanton, the executive director here. And I just wanna get going. So I am going to turn it over to Cape Perry. Palisades Village is, as we were discussing earlier, we're a volunteer run organization and it's our events committee that puts together these programs. And Kate, a member of our events committee was kind enough to arrange this and uh, I'll turn it over to her. No, I rushed to volunteer to do this. <laughs> um, I'm all, also on the board of Palisades Village, which has been just a wonderful worthwhile experience for me. But it's my very great pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Janet Mann, who will speak to us today about her discoveries and research on seemingly all aspects of bottleneck dolphins, social networks, female reproduction, conservation, social learning and culture, and so much more. Janet earned her BS at Brown University and her MS and PhD at the University of Michigan. She is a professor and provost at Georgetown University here in Washington. Janet manages an international team of scientists on three continents. She has published over 130 scientific papers and several books and received a number of significant awards and recognition. Wonderfully, she's even had a children's book written about her and her research. Uh, we are especially lucky that Janet, who lives here in the Palisades, is here with us today to share her expertise. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand this now over to Janet. Thank you away, Professor. Thank you. Take it away, Professor Mann. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. It's a real pleasure to talk to Palisades Village, which uh, we've been involved in for a number of years. And <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen in a moment, but I did want to say I served as a vice provost, not as a provost, because that would put me in charge of uh, way too much money. And um, I stepped down from that role in, in 2013, so I could focus, 2017, sorry, so I could focus on research. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share my- Oh, let me just say one housekeeping measure, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, we were going to ask you, if you don't mind, to hold your questions till the end. But if you need clarification of anything, just please enter that into the chat. We will be monitoring that. Um, but we'll have plenty of time at the end to, to uh, get into questions and answers. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Potomac Dolphins, Fact or Fiction? I think you probably already know the answer, but on the uh, lead slide, you see a bottlenose dolphin in, uh, from Shark Bay, my long-term field site. And first I wanna credit how I got started in this. So when I was an undergraduate at Brown, I uh, did research on baboons uh, with one of my mentors, Gene Altman. And I got very interested in uh, dolphins serendipitously. So I wasn't what we call a flipper file. I didn't start out interested in dolphins. I was sort of more interested in just animals generally and primates. So I've come from Savannah to sea and I want to credit three, three uh, significant uh, figures. Um, Jane Goodall, who inspired me when I was in high school. That was what got me interested in animals in the first place. I basically, I saw her on television and read everything I could about her. And uh, many young women also, and men, um, were inspired to go into wildlife research uh, from seeing that Jane could walk around the forest and you could do that for a career. Um, Jean Altman was uh, my mentor when I was an undergraduate where I went to study baboons. And then Barbara Smuts was my PhD mentor who also studied baboons and was also a student of Jane's. So I'm kind of an academic <clears throat> granddaughter of, of Jane Goodall. And it was Barb who invited me to go out to Australia when I was in graduate school to start the project on dolphins. And that led me to Shark Bay. I'm gonna, um, and all the way, it's literally 13,000 miles away. It's as far as you can get from Washington, DC. And we started a, a field project there on wild bottlenose dolphins and have been studying them for now 35 years. Wow. 
And one of the amazing things about these dolphins is that they have a range of um, hunting tactics that have become well known. And the first slide, you, I mean, the upper uh, left, you see trevally hunting, that's hunting these giant fish that are a meter in length. Um, they do this belly up foraging we call snacking. They do what's called beaching or strand foraging where they beach themselves on the sand to catch mullet. And then you turn back in a behavior called shelling where they lift the, it's the largest snail found in the world is this uh, turbinella snail. They get absolutely gigantic, much bigger than this. And they um, lift those out of the water and the fish hiding in them. The, the snail is no longer in there, but the fish hide in the, in the shells and they lift it out of the water to drain the fish out. Um, and then famously, this sponging behavior where they uh, tear off sponges. Sponges are marine sponges. They're actually an animal. They tear it off the seafloor and they put it on their beak and use that um, to ferret uh, prey that are hiding in deep channels. And I just put a, a cormorant here. Um, they call them shags in Australia, but uh, one of the females in Australia, her specialty was slamming into shags or cormorants and making them drop the fish. <laughs> so each dolphin has a different uh, foraging tactic. Okay. Um, and people have long been fascinated with dolphins, um, their evolution, because they have an amazing, um, they've come from the land and have moved back, to, back into the water. They are mammals, of course. Uh, they have exquisite echolocation abilities. This is just showing you they have a very big brain in here. And then they uh, send out signals through the melon. Um, they actually have nasal sacs that make that help them produce the sounds. They don't actually have vocal cords. It's sort of, they produce kind of nasalizations. And it's focused through um, this fatty melon in their forehead. Um, and the sound comes out, in this case, echolocation. And then they receive the sound. Um, back like clicks or other sounds through their oil filled jaw and that which is then processed by the inner ear. Um, and of course their intelligence uh, um, and very large brains attract people they have uh, next to humans they have um, the largest brains of any well several species of any animal um, on the planet and uh, that's controlling for body size so it's relative it's relative to the body size. And so you can think of dolphins as having a brain three times the size of a chimpanzee. And I can say that because Jane Goodall isn't on this call. And um, the behavior in ecology is fascinating. Um, this is a, actually a mud ring uh, foraging technique where the dolphins create kind of a net from um, around the, a school of fish by beating their tails uh, on the sand and they can um, encircle the fish and then uh, feed off of them. And this is a behavior we actually think they might be doing um, more locally. So uh, because I'm a workaholic and my husband wanted to get me away from my work um, and my husband's here, Tom Demuth, and he wanted a place on the water and we started looking at little cottages on the lower Potomac and then we settled on this one here and uh, so he wanted us to go there and relax and uh, basically for me to stop working <laughs> but the day we closed on the house I walked into the backyard which you see here and said oh look dolphins and uh, lo and behold, there were dolphins that were swimming in, in the Potomac River. This, our house uh, is on the, it's in a little town called Ophelia um, in the Northern neck of Virginia. And um, it's sort of near the mouth of the Potomac River and uh, which empties into the Chesapeake Bay. And this was a regular event. We um, would see dolphins periodically um, in the backyard. And I'm sure my husband thought, oh no. <laughs> um, and I started thinking, hmm, I've been going really far to study dolphins. And here they are right here in the backyard. And it turns out uh, that dolphins have been as far up as um, Alexandria and Washington, DC. Um, here's a um, newspaper, um, well, two, uh, two newspapers from the, um, uh, late 1800s, 
and uh, dolphins were seen, they call them porpoises then, off of Alexandria. And then uh, a scientist who worked for the Smithsonian, uh, Fred, Frederick True, shown here, uh, reported they're regularly seen off of um, uh, Glimmer, uh, Maryland, which is not too far, it's about 20 miles south of Washington, DC. Um, and there were other reports, uh, but all in the 1800s about dolphins being in the Potomac River. And here, I'm not gonna read you the whole article, um, but the uh, Republic had published, um, the National Republican had uh, published an article in 1884 about dolphins that were all the way up um, around Georgetown and uh, Chain Bridge. And as you can see from the article, if you look a little bit down, it says rumor had soon magnified the porpoise that was seen early in the morning swimming in the midst of a school of rockfish between the aqueduct and Chain Bridge into a shark, two sharks, a whale, the sea serpent, and a school of seals, etc. Um, and they were trying to kill it, like a crowd came and people were shooting at it and, and oh. uh, trying to kill the dolphin. And this went on for quite a while, but it, they were fortunately unsuccessful and the dolphin swam away. But um, it's quite an amusing article and clearly the reporter is uh, quite amused by the event. So then there seems to be like a hundred year gap or more than a hundred year gap <laughs> Um, and we have been actually looking to see, well, you know, would did the dolphins just disappear? Uh, why are there only reports from the late 1800s? And um, I'll come back to that. So then, you know, I could go kayaking in my backyard and there'd be dolphins um, swimming along, as you see here. Um, but tragedy struck in 2013. We had bought the house in 2012. And um, there's what's called an unusual mortality event that dolphins were stranding along the coastline uh, between, um, I'm actually gonna ask if um, you haven't muted, if there, I can hear some background noise. So if you haven't got the mute on, if you could, because if I can hear it, so can everybody else. Um, so um, there's a, this unusual, it's called an unusual mortality event when you get a bunch of strandings and uh, it was actually linked to a specific disease, not unlike COVID, um, but called uh, morbillivirus and I'll return to that. But most of the um, strandings of dead dolphins occurred in Virginia waters, as you can see here. Um, so the blue bars are the regular stranding rate because dolphins do die and wash up. And then um, an unusual mortality event is a spike of this. And um, so this is just showing you what NOAA documented up and down the coast. It also, so the plurality were in Virginia waters um, in sort of the lower Chesapeake. And it also started there. And this is just showing you within the Chesapeake, um, there weren't any that we washed up in the Potomac, but in the Chesapeake waters and um, along the coastline. And so it started here and then moved um, up and down the coastline as the dolphins moved uh, seasonally. Okay. So morbillivirus is related to measles and canine distemper. And there are multiple strains in marine mammals. It's a very deadly uh, disease, much like, um, uh, more deadly than COVID actually, because more than 50% of the dolphins um, in, on our, in our coastal waters died from this outbreak. Um, so it was a very severe epidemic. Um, the causes aren't known, but it's thought that animals that are um, in stressed either because of prey depletion or because of uh, environmental, other environmental stressors uh, might be more vulnerable to these outbreaks. Um, and the last outbreak on the East Coast was in the late 1980s. Um, and it's transmitted through respiratory vapors. You can see kind of here is the dolphin breathing and all of this water um, droplets kind of come bursting out of the air, but they breathe together. And so they can share uh, respiratory vapor just like we do when we're talking to each other or coughing on each other. So this is how it's spread. It is a respiratory uh, virus that's deadly. So because of this, um, when this happened, and uh, that made me think, well, we've got to start studying these animals and find out 
um, what's going on and find out um, what kinds of problems and difficulties they're having in the river in the Chesapeake Bay. And also we were interested uh, in determining their social structure so that we could look at how disease is transmitted uh, from individual to individual. So which populations do these dolphins interact with? Um, how uh, do they just interact with each other or like how is disease sort of spreading and how does that, how does that happen? And that, um, for that, I also recruited a colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Shweta Bansal at uh, Georgetown University. She joined me and her graduate student, uh, Melissa Collier, to look at um, how transmission happens between the dolphins by looking at who they're connected to, very much like the contact tracing that, uh, uh, that we kind of gave up on, but started at the start of the epidemic. If you look at your, your contact network, we still do it, um, but if you look at your contact network and here's a, a, actually the Shark Bay network and showing you um, the number of contacts individuals uh, have with the circles, the red circles represent females and blue circles represent males. And if you look at the connections between them, um, the, the line sort of in the thickness of the lines is a, is a network model for how often they contact each other. So by modeling this, you could look at, if you know who contacts who, you can model how disease would move through the population. Um, and we can, uh, this can help us uh, understand how disease is moving from the dolphins in the Potomac and Chesapeake to um, other parts of the uh, Western Atlantic. So why are dolphins important? They are top predators um, and they are a sign of a healthy river. So they are, because they're apex predators, meaning they're sort of at the top of the food chain. Um, they don't have any predators we know of in the bay, uh, as, except, you know, perhaps humans. Um, they, but being top predators, they have a disproportionate effect on the bay. And also they are, a flagship species. Um, they're charismatic and people are interested in what um, dolphins are doing in the bay and in the river. And if you, uh, you can also consider them an umbrella species because they use a large area. If you protect dolphins, you have to protect very large areas. So we think of them as important because of their influence on our waterways and also that by protecting them, and you can get people interested in protecting them, you can protect everything else that lives in those waterways. Um, another big factor is that, the, surprisingly, the dolphins in the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay are not um, part of um, NOAA's stock assessments. Um, they're not yet acknowledged as even existing. And so if you live in the district, you know, we have a taxation without representation. Well, they, um, they need conservation, um, but don't have representation. And so um, what I'm showing you here is like that, this is the, um, the NOAA data on the different stocks. And I have something called the Northern Migratory Stock, which starts is in the summers as far North and, and moves down to as far as the Carolinas in uh, the winter. Um, and nothing is acknowledged in, again, the Chesapeake Bay or Potomac. The Southern Migratory Stock, which uh, is off of kind of um, Virginia, Virginia waters and goes down to as far down to lower North Carolina. And then what's called the Northern North Carolina Estuary Stock, which moves just a tightly along the coastline <clears throat> from Virginia to North Carolina. So we think actually all members of all three stocks come into the Chesapeake Bay, uh, but they aren't represented anywhere as far as NOAA is concerned, although we're working with NOAA on that. So um, Ani Jacoby, who's in the upper left here, um, I recruited to uh, work with me on this project. She was my undergraduate at at Georgetown University now, she is a Duke graduate student. And our main objectives was, were why are dolphins coming into the Potomac? How many are there? Are the same ones coming back? Where do they winter? 
what is their population structure? How far up the river do they go? And what are the threats to the dolphins? And um, Ani in particular is looking at the history and um, looking, interviewing watermen to get in, uh, information on, because um, many of them have grown up on the river for generations. Um, how long have they been seeing dolphins? Is this just a recent thing that we're suddenly seeing them? Um, or is it something that's been going on for a long time? She's also looking at archives of uh, small newspapers uh, around the Chesapeake and uh, along the Potomac from small, from small towns and searching those for mentions of dolphins or porpoises as they were called in the past. Um, a bit about dolphin society, I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly, but uh, they're very long lived. Um, there's some dolphins in Florida that are known to live into their 60s. And we have dolphins in Australia that are have lived into their 50s. Um, they nurse their young for a very long time, two to six years, um, two to eight years, sorry. The mother is central to dolphin society that um, they form sort of roughly um, rough kin groups. They join and leave each other all the time. So they're not really in a pod. Uh, they don't stay with the same individuals, but uh, the Females are, are sort of central to that, uh, to the social structure. And they have their first calf uh, between eight and 13 years, at least probably in the Potomac and Chesapeake. Um, in, in Australia, it's usually not till 12 or 13. And the males form alliances, meaning that they have these stable male partners that cooperate both to try and gain access to females and to keep and compete with other males. And these alliances, uh, tend to be fairly stable and last for uh, decades. And um, it's usually two or three, or sometimes four males that spend a lot of time together. Okay. Um, we do uh, surveys and here's our boat, it's called a Hoya. Um, and uh, we do surveys in the lower Potomac and we uh, record behavior and group membership. And we try to get rough uh, indications of their age um, and uh, sex if we can. If they have a young calf, we know it's a female. Um, and we do what's called photo ID. We photograph, um, and this one, we name them after significant um, leaders. This one's called Ulysses S. Grant. And we take photographs of their dorsal fins and we match those up. Um, this is the area we work in. It's in the lower Potomac. If you can see this map uh, of the Chesapeake and the Potomac River and Washington DC is all the way up here. Um, uh, but we do uh, search a large area. We're hoping to expand. Um, and then these orange lines in here, because we also do these transect lines uh, so that we can get at least uh, some local abundance um, estimates there. Um, this is from our um, earlier results, but it's pretty consistent that we see most of, we see this is the number of sightings um, of no, mean, meaning number of groups. Um, it peaks in the summer months, so June, July, and August. Um, actually, there's still quite a lot of dolphins around um, in September uh, before they move south for the winter. Um, and uh, we do see a lot more individuals, different individuals also during um, the warm months. And we do sort of these periodic surveys in April and May, and then we try to do a, a sort of a lot more sampling in the warm months when the animals have, are there. Um, the group sizes vary. Um, sometimes we see lone dolphins. Um, they're often in small groups, but they can be in these clusters. We've had some, some groups that are over 200 dolphins. Um, and we see the same dolphins, um, about a quarter of them we see, see across years. So this is, um, showing you below a dolphin that we've uh, seen every year. Um, and we see them repeatedly within a year, but it's kind of, because there are a lot of dolphins, which I'll explain, um, we see them, um, you know, where we have like a 20, roughly 25% chance of seeing them within a year too, depending how, how much time we're spending on the water. Um, and we see them together with some of their same associates or friends. Um, the males are seen with the same males and we see a lot of the females hanging out with the same females year after year. And just to show you, cause we did decide cause it's the Potomac to name them after 
uh, uh, leaders. We start with presidents and first ladies and vice presidents. Um, we've uh, done a lot of Supreme Court justices and um, other significant um, uh, leaders of uh, suffrage and uh, um, abolitionist uh, movement leaders. And um, Bill Clinton is, um, we see him pretty regularly. He likes to bow ride or kind of ride around the bow of the boat uh, very frequently. Um, we, the males, as I said, are in these alliances and we have the trio, which is uh, George W. Bush, uh, Zachary Taylor, who is the 12th president and uh, Jimmy Carter. So we don't do it according to their political affiliations. And actually these guys we have gone, um, have been cited uh, way up north by Annapolis. So we know that at least some of them have been moving around and hopefully you can see that their dorsal fins are different. Um, and this is Barbara Bush. And I love this photo because we named it Barbara Bush because the uh, tooth breaks, which are probably from males um, on her dorsal fin remind me of her hair. Um, and uh, this is Nancy Pelosi and um, her offspring, uh, uh, Alexandra uh, Pelosi. Um, we named the, the, the kids after the, the same as the mother. So, um, and uh, Martha Washington, who we see um, quite often. Of course, Martha Washington has had um, uh, several offspring and in real life she only had two before she met George so um, we have to be creative with naming the offspring and here um, you can see is George is George Washington who does not actually hang out with Martha Washington uh, Frederick Doug Douglas um, Harriet Tubman and Alexander Hamilton we had another dolphin. Uh, we originally named Alexander Hamilton, but then uh, she had a calf, so we made turned her into Eliza Hamilton. Um, how many dolphins are there? Well, the first year uh, we surprisingly identified 193, um, then 306 by the next year, about 800 by 2017, 1,000 by 2018, over 1,200 by 2019 to 2020. And now we have over 2000 uh, individually identified dolphins and um, it's very time consuming to try and match up their dorsal fins. Um, but I'll tell you a little more about that. So where do they winter? Um, for this, we've collaborated with what's called the um, OBA Sea Map, but they have a, there's a catalog called the Mid-Atlantic Bonnells Dolphin Catalog. And there's, uh, from 18 sites up and down the coast where people do photograph dolphins. Our site is here. Um, and since people photograph dolphins up and down the coast, we can try to match the dolphins we see uh, with the sightings at other locations. Uh, so we do collaborate and we submit all of our photos to this big catalog. And then we try to match up uh, the dolphins we've seen here with the dolphins up and down the coast. Um, and the way we do this, um, well, just, well, briefly, I'll tell you. So ours is called the Maryland uh, PCDB, uh, P Potomac Chesapeake Dolphin Project, uh, because there already is one for Virginia down here um, uh, near Virginia Beach. Uh, but there's one for New Jersey and um, North Carolina. And so we have matched dolphins that we've seen here with all of these locations. So we know these dolphins are moving around um, and we do this using um, machine learning and we've used two different uh, machine learning programs. Um, but George Mason, for example, who was uh, photographed in the Potomac in 2015 and 2017, um, we use FinFinder is one of the programs but we also have used a Google uh, matching program. Um, which can trace the fins and um, help us identify. And um, just to give you an idea, um, if one person was running all of these comparisons without artificial intelligence, it would take two years. <laughs> but with um, AI, it only takes us uh, a few months, but it still takes a long time um, to match all the fins that we've taken. 
And um, this just to show you George Mason uh, here, who was seen off of uh, North Carolina in 2008 and 2010. So we've seen him, so we get a sense of how old he is, um, just because we know he, he's, he was an adult in 2008, so it makes him older than when we first started seeing him in 2015. Um, so the matches suggest that, the, that at least three populations are using this area. Um, as I mentioned, these three different, what are called migratory stocks. And so the Chesapeake and Potomac seem to be very important for probably the dolphins are mixing here. And it seems common, we would see a lot of socializing, um, including mating behavior um, in the Potomac. Um, and we have lots of newborn babies. They get these fetal lines, which you can see these sort of stripes along the side of the body from when they're curled up in the womb. And those last for a couple of months. So we can get good age estimates of calves, but they're definitely having their calves here. And we even documented a birth in the Potomac it was a rough day, so the photos aren't that great, but you can see how tiny the baby is um, next to the mother uh, here. And that was the mother, she didn't have a baby and then there was blood in the water and then the baby popped out um, and that was in the Potomac River. And uh, we did recite the, the uh, mother and calf um, a month later. So, um, and we named it uh, after the mother after Patsy Mink, who was the first uh, Asian American woman in Congress and her daughter, uh, Wendy Mink, actually lives uh, somewhere up in, in Maryland. Um, so I've mentioned before that the mothers are important. Um, we've you know, definitively identified um, uh, 253 mothers and uh, actually over 300 calves. Um, and the births are peaking here in May to June, particularly. And uh, we can tell survival because we do, we, for the mothers we see the next year, we know whether they've had another baby or, you know, or gotten pregnant or lost their, their previous calf. So we are trying to monitor calf survival. Um, they do spend a lot of time foraging. Uh, they're probably here mainly for the fish. They like the warm water and also they're, uh, they don't seem to have any shark scars. So it, um, there's very low predation, even though some bull sharks are known to come in here, um, they don't seem to be, have to worry about predators here. Um, and just to, they can locate a lot of these fish because the fish are soniferous or make sounds. I'm gonna play a few of the fish sounds. Um, this is gonna be croaker. Oh, there we go. And they like croaker just like humans do. Um, and weak fish is another soniferous fish that they um, that they go for. Usually, the if the fish usually if the fish hear um, the dolphins, then they'll usually go quiet. Um, and also another um, spot is also kind of croaker fish also, and also makes very loud um, sounds. And these uh, we've, so they go after these in the, in the Potomac and um, Chesapeake and some of these other species that you see here. Okay. <laughs> Stop that one, it's gonna keep replaying. Okay. Um, and they toss the fish. Sometimes we're lucky we get a photograph and can identify what they're um, foraging on. They do that often to like kind of stun the fish so they could then swallow it head first. And um, so by throwing it, the fish usually just kind of freak out and lie on the surface and then the dolphin swallows them. Um, we do, to tell how far up the Potomac and how they're using the Potomac, we put these acoustic devices down that are, um, the C pods that you see on the right are record their sonar, their echolocation clicks. So we can put these deployments out and leave them for months. And then we get um, lots and lots of data. Um, and then we have sound traps, um, which record everything. Um, so these are the uh, sites, you know, here's Washington DC up here. 
And then if you know the 301 bridge or where uh, it's about where Dahlgren is, um, we, uh, we put these um, acoustic deployments uh, to record uh, so we could tell dolphin presence year round, but also uh, detect their use of the river and um, the pattern of their use of the river. Um, and it, this is showing Ani and Ellen. Ellen is my grad student and uh, Ani's at Duke and sort of how we set up these deployments where we have a sound trap on the um, left and this C pod uh, on the right. Um, it's a pretty elaborate operation and also a pretty messy one because when we pull them up, they're covered in sea squirts and barnacles and we have to clean everything off, uh, and try to get the data out, et cetera. Um, and we're getting, um, we're getting good data on dolphin presence so we can show, uh, we can't say how many dolphins are there, but we do, can get good presence absence data um, year round. And, um, and also we're hoping to look at some patterns of the, their use of the river. Um, and we know they're going up uh, to Dahlgren and a bit past that regularly um, from just the preliminary data we have. And just to show, this is one of our sonograms that um, we've, well, this is the, a spectrogram of Potomac dolphins, but just to play you what the whistles sound like, um, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. It's pretty faint, but those what whistles just kind of sound like. And they have different types of whistles that they have. The clicks, I think you'll be able to hear better. These are the, this is their sonar that they use for foraging. Uh, what you heard at the end with that buzzing going up, that's when they're going after, uh, they've honed in on a fish and um, their clicks get very fast and it sounds, it starts to sound it, it continuous and um, we can get a sense even of what they're probably catching or how much, how, how many prey they're catching if you have like good recordings. Um, the risk to dolphins, um, this is uh, from the Smithsonian where I took my students, uh, the whale warehouse, which is where they keep all the big bones um, uh, in, out in uh, um, Sweetland, uh, Maryland. But this is a bottlenose dolphin skull, this is where the big brain is. But as you can see, this dolphin got tangled in uh, monofilament fishing line and it worked through its straw and died. And it was probably a pretty young animal because its teeth are in really good shape, um, but uh, clearly could not probably starved to death just getting was wrapped up in this um, fishing line. And here's just one of the dolphins that we photographed um, that also had a big hunk of fishing line um, trailing. And we do uh, occasionally see dolphins with uh, fishing lines so that it, fishing interactions is a problem. Uh, one of our, the dolphins that we'd photographed, John Hancock, who we had sighted in the Potomac River 2016, 2017, um, in 2018 and then 2019, um, he had stranded off of Virginia Beach and we matched him up from a, um, he had a fishing um, interaction, at, uh, I mean, a, an interaction with fishing gear um, that killed him. Um, and they also do get skin conditions. Um, this is just showing you um, some of the more dramatic uh, skin conditions that they have. We don't know what all of these are. We do know, we can identify some of them like lobomycosis, it's a fungal disease, and then uh, pox virus, and there are some others that we can detect. Um, but the animals that are really badly scarred, like scarred with lesions, um, we usually don't see them again. Um, so we think that this population is important that it's um, because of its, uh, as I've said, the apex predators, uh, almost everything's been studied, it seems like, in the Chesapeake and Potomac, but for some reason, uh, there's hardly anything done about the dolphins. Um, and we're hoping that would motivate public interest and protection of the Potomac River and the Bay. Um, and they are good indicators of health or degradation because they come to the surface and you could see 
um, what's going on with them. And we think it's an important breeding area um, again, the th that three populations are mixing and um, the little bits of genetic data that they have for these populations don't differentiate the population. So even though NOAA says they're three separate populations, we think that they come in here and um, uh, might be breeding here. Uh, so uh, we have had lots of sponsors that have um, helped us out with uh, a bits um, of support and that helps us keep the project going. Um, Georgetown helped us get it started and then there have been a number of um, contributors who have donated, uh, donated to the project. Uh, we run a nonprofit through, uh, through, through Georgetown, we keep an account there and so it has a 501c3 uh, status. And I'm going to um, play you a video, but I am going to turn the sound down. Um, and so you can, I can take questions uh, while you get to watch dolphins swimming. <laughs> so I'll keep the share up, but I'm open for questions. We have a Erica, couple can questions. you put Kate on the screen? I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to call on people if we're doing share screen. Okay. Well, just a people moment. should be able to control it. Um, I have I have you being the dominant person at the moment, spotlighted. Um, uh, but we do have a Kate, question in the chat about um, are dolphins tolerant of fresh water? And relatedly, do you know how far north in the broader Chesapeake Bay they're found? Yeah, um, so they can tolerate fresh water for brief periods. Otherwise they um, would be vulnerable to like bacterial infection and so on, but they could, um, they do, <clears throat> as long as they're not stuck in fresh water, um, they'd be fine. Um, but, you know, so for a few days or a week, they'd probably be okay, but they would, um, they can't stay there. Um, sorry, and the second question was, Oh, was, uh, how far up? How the far Chesapeake. north in the Chesapeake? Yes. Um, they seem to be going, there, there are some sightings of them up uh, up by Baltimore. Um, so, I mean, they're going pretty far up. We just don't know how abundant they are. I think we happen to hit a hot spot where we are because we do <laughs> see, like when we're there in the warm months, um, we will see dolphins every day. Um, so, uh, and we've do obviously documented a lot of dolphins. It's so exciting. So I have a question. I'll get, keep the ball rolling. This is Kate again. Um, a, on a lighter note, but I am very interested in, in what you mentioned about echolocation and their responses to sounds as well as creating their own sounds. But here's something. Um, do dolphins respond to or like classical music? And I ask this because I heard recently that world-renowned cellist Yo-Yo Ma traveled on the Hukalaya famous canoe off the big island. And he performed for native Hawaiian researchers with the University of Hawaii, Hawaii Marine Mammal Research Program. He played somewhere over the rainbow and a whale beached. Do you think there's a correlation? Well, it's probably not good if a whale beached. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, breached, just, breached, oh, breached, breached with an R, okay. yes, breached. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if they were, it, it, they would only really be able to hear it if it was, if they were playing it underwater. Uh, so they were, they, that, they had sound devices underwater. Yeah, I mean, dolphins, um, many years ago, we actually, um, did play uh, the dolphins in Shark Bay anyway, um, uh, some some music and they were interested. They kind of listened, they hung around and listened. It was above water, but they had their heads there. They had their jaw kind of, well, they're partly out of the water. It would, it would have been hard for them to hear because it's through the jaw. Um, so, but I don't know the full answer to that. I do know that they can mimic uh, musical sounds. Um, and so they have been, um, they will, I, I know they've been trained to mimic like the Batman song, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> da, 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 they, they can do that. Um, 
and probably have other talents, but they're not really singers the way the baleen whales are. Baleen whales produce what's called song. Um, dolphins produce um, a lot of communicative sounds and echolocation, but not they're not singers. We've got Thank some you. more questions in the chat. Are dolphins in the Chesapeake more susceptible to injury from fishing gear in boats than in the open ocean? Does your team intervene when you can, can with dolphins tangled in fishing gear or are you strictly observers and catalogers? Yeah, so as far as um, intervening, we do, um, uh, we do call it in, there's two, uh, stranding network networks. Um, unfortunately, they are far away. Um, so we don't have with the equipment to actually capture and, and free a dolphin. Although, you know, if one was caught in a net and couldn't get out, I would probably just jump in and rescue it. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, but we're actually, uh, we, we did do the training to deal with stranded dolphins um, if they have washed up. And if they're distressed, we call it in, but you need, um, you need equipment to um, encircle them and, and capture them if that's the case. And you just can't, you know, if an animal's free swimming with um, fishing line on it, there's nothing that we could really do. Um, and, you know, except if somebody came down with, you know, boats and nets and tried to, you know, encircle mm -hmm. it and capture it and do something um, to free it. Um, as far as uh, entanglement and fishing gear, I mean, the the closer to coast the coast they are, the more vulnerable they are because there's heavier uh, fishing activity. Um, and so, uh, I think probably less is happening off of you know in the Chesapeake and um, rivers than further south because they have real problems in the Carolinas uh, with lots of dolphins. There's you know heavier fishing like year round. Um, com um, but they're vulnerable to like pound nets and um, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they are vulnerable. And we do see fishing line marks on them for some that have escaped from fishing net. Mm -hmm. In the times between when you noted in newspaper reports in the 1800s and when you found them in 2012, do you think they were continuously in the Potomac? Um, so in terms of um, their presence, I think that they have been here um, sort of on and off um, over that period. So uh, the reports that we get from the watermen and some of the, and also from the newspaper suggest that, they're, that they have been uh, coming here. Um, there was a period in the, in the, 50s and 60s where the Potomac was really so polluted and disgusting that um, President Johnson declared it a disgrace. Um, so I, I hope the dolphins weren't uh, in the river then. Uh, so it's fluctuated and um, we're hoping to get a better sense of what those fluctuations might be about. But um, the watermen have reported that in recent, just in the last few years, that they have been seeing dolphins more frequently. Wonderful. Is there only one variety, the bottlenose? Uh, yes, we only have bottlenose dolphins in the uh, Potomac, um, Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay. Um, there are occasionally um, uh, harbor porpoises. Um, uh, a little bit further north, typically, but uh, and 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 south, but um, they aren't usually in the bay. Occasionally, and occasionally a humpback whale will show up too. And there have been reports also of um, manatees occasionally that have gotten lost, or male looking for a female, and it's gone a little too far north. <laughs> This is Kate again, and I do have another question, if that's okay, because the chat room, chat box is now empty, everybody. No, it's um, not. Sure. We still have yeah. one more. Oh, well, let me just go ahead since okay. I've started. Yeah. Um, and that is, I've noticed, by the way, in the last several weeks, there have actually been several articles in both the Washington Post and I believe also the New York Times on dolphins. And one thing that I focused on is uh, that 
that we've always known that human caused sounds affect the ocean populations, including uh, dolphins. And I'm just quoting here, the ruckus from boat traffic, comma, offshore drilling and submarine sonar can be sensory overload for aquatic life. And related to that in the same article, it mentions a research team that has noted that dolphins have apparently been uh, uh, recorded as raising their, having to raise their voices in order to be heard between each other. And I'm just wondering if you would comment on that. So it's noise pollution basically in the ocean. Yeah, noise pollution is a huge problem for marine mammals um, because noise travels very quickly in water and um, unattenuated in water. And also the dolphins don't, right, you know, there's nothing, there's no barriers for them to protect themselves from, from loud sounds and they can't, you know, put their hands over their ears even. But um, so sound just moves unattenuated through the water. So it is a, it, it is, uh, a huge problem for marine mammals. And um, yes, it is true that dolphins will um, uh, sort of raise the volume in order to communicate um, uh, due, to, um, due to human made sounds in the water. And um, if these are very, it's a bigger problem for the deep diving animals because they move very slowly um, well, they move slowly and they lower their heart rate um, when they dive. Um, and so uh, and the sound goes into these kind of deep channels. And so if there are sound blasts, they can't speed up because their heart rate is slow and they can't get to the surface um, quick enough. And um, they're the animals who, who seem to get da really damaged and uh, will die from uh, from very loud sounds. They can't escape. Um, the smaller delphinids, like smaller dolphins, uh, can kind of race away at the surface and leap out of the water. Uh, and that's how they escape. But for diving, like the beaked whales and sperm whales, um, their mechanism for avoiding like a predator or something is to dive very deep, um, which just doesn't work if you to avoid a sound. Okay, next question. Is the mud circling around dolphins analogous to chimps using sticks as tools? Um, yeah, well, it's argued, I've argued in favor that it does kind of qualify as tool use because they're controlling um, an external um, object, whether it be mud, um, you know, in, in order to make it do something. Uh, and in this case, like netting, it's sort of like they're netting fish using in a natural environment because the fish don't like to swim through the um, the muddy the muddy ring. Um, it's similar to also humpbacks use uh, bubbles to make bubble nets and uh, do the same thing. It, the prey all stay together. I'll stop sharing because uh, the video is over. <laughs> okay. Um, have there been any seals? seen recently in the Potomac? Um, occasionally there's a seal scene, um, but it's it's unusual. But occasionally th there's a uh, um, harbor seal that will wander in. There's both harbor seals and gray seals on the, in the, you know, Western Atlantic. I don't think gray seals have been seen much in the um, Chesapeake. Okay. Please comment on how dolphins would be impacted by offshore wind turbines. Yeah, I don't know enough about the um, wind turbines, but it really depends on the um, amount of sound or vibration underwater that they're they're producing. Um, and you know, it also so I don't I don't know. I mean, there's some concern that it might have a bigger impact um, on larger whales, the, dol the dolphins are staying, you know, a bit probably closer to shore. All right, um, someone clearly 
loves your presentation and wants to know if you're available to present to other groups. Um, well, you can always con you can always contact me. I, you know, I like to share the science, and um, it depends on the group and the timing. <laughs> <laughs> Are the identifying features on the fins naturally occurring or due to damaging interactions? Uh, so most of the nicks that they have are from probably from each other and particularly the males. So the males are more damaged than the females because of fighting with each other. And also the males can be, are not necessarily so nice to the females either. Uh, sometimes it's just from rough housing. Um, so young animals like playing together, they'll get some nicks and scrapes on their dorsal fin. But a lot of them have tooth rakes from each other. Um, sometimes it'd be kind of borderline playful and sometimes it's aggressive. Um, someone was asking if this presentation will be available. And yes, it will be on our YouTube channel. So you can see it there. Um, what is the children's book written about you, Janet? Um, it's called The Dolphins of Shark Bay, and it's um, uh, by Pamela Turner, and she's written um, a lovely series of books about uh, wildlife biologists around the world. So she has, uh, if you know a, a kid, I mean, most of them are kind of between, aimed for like, I don't know, eight, eight to 15 year olds, I suppose. Um, although adults tell me they, they like it, her book. So um, she's a very good science writer and she came out and um, spent a lot of time with us. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, the rest of the comments are just about how wonderful this presentation it is. Excellent, super interesting and amazing, wonderful. Thank you. I, I certainly hope that you will look forward to coming back and talking again with us um, if with you know about any new developments. Um, I think there are people on today's talk who were not with us you know those many years ago in, in someone's living room when we had an in-person talk by you. And um, we have to catch you when you're actually here and not in Australia, which is a long way to go. Um, but it would be so wonderful if you would come back to us because I think it's a fascinating story with ongoing new knowledge and I, you are to be credited and shame on Noah. What can we do to help? We got to get Noah on now, board are, here. I mean, they do know, they do know about the dolphins. In fact, one of my former graduate students is at Noah, and uh, you know, we talk all the time. I mean, we have to also provide them um, with the data. So we are trying to get the get the message out. It does mess with their cleanly divided stock structure. <laughs> so I think that, um, but they they respond to data. So it'll, it'll get there. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for your time. Yeah, yeah. This thank was you. wonderful. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, unless somebody's okay. got another riveting question, I think, yes, we should applaud. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just thank want to you, give Janet, a plug so for help, helping to clean the Potomac up as well. And, and <laughs> so. Tom, thank you so much for it's... arguing that you needed a getaway house. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, is there something that we as a group or individuals can be doing to help clean the Potomac? Well, there's a, a couple of great organizations, the Potomac Riverkeeper Network mm -hmm. um, and also the Potomac Conservancy are both really dedicated. I, wor I work with them frequently um, to help, kind of help pr promote cleaning the, the river, but the, they are very involved in, in policy and the Potomac Riverkeeper sometimes gets involved in like, you know, suing polluters and uh, stopping them from of doing uh, damage to the Potomac. Um, so those are the two um, groups, uh, you know, that are uh, are dedicated to cleaning, cleaning. There are other, uh, there are other mm -hmm. organizations, but um, I think both of them are great. All Wonderful. right. So yeah, get involved, clean up the plastics, mm -hmm. stop the sewage stop the chemical pollution. Um, yeah, 
there's there's a lot of the Potomac still has a lot of problems. It's not as clean fertilizer. as it could be. Oh yeah, fertilizer runoff. Um, fertilizer is a big one, you know, and also, um, yeah, uh, protecting it from uh, uh, runoff from uh, either agriculture or also just what people put on their lawns and all that. That is one of the big efforts of EPA's Chesapeake Bay office. Um, they have mm. there's a, an agreement between, actually, I think it's between Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia primarily. But and, and Nancy Stoner, who I used to work with at EPA, I believe is still head of um, yeah uh, Potomac the, Conservancy, and she was head of the Water Office at EPA. So yeah, she's at the Potomac Riverkeeper Network. But oh, you're, yeah, Riverkeeper. you're right. She is heading yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. The PRK, yeah. yeah so I worked with her first when she was a lowly attorney at the Justice Department. And look what happened. So she's a good voice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And thank yeah. you again, Janet, again and again. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.